uh, getting back to your point where you said uh, it takes time mm -hmm. to develop uh, these medication uh, I'm just wondering you will find that probably in a rural area there's a traditional healer with no uh, education but they manage to treat people and mm -hmm. administer certain dosage mm -hmm. you know without having to go through that experiments and mm -hmm. lab experiments to really know how much they mm -hmm. need you know but people still survive yeah no I think the point was that the tr I agree yeah the yeah. traditional healer may not have a formal training he never went to university mm -hmm. but he learned from somebody maybe his grandmother or his grandfather so it's a knowledge acquired mm -hmm. I agree the point I made was that when we develop a new medicine I'm thinking more like a new pills that you can buy in the pharmacy the pharmaceutical company okay. is not just that he the per, this pharmaceutical company went to the healer oh this healer is using this bark mixed with uh, palm wine eh? okay I'll use that to turn this that has been traditionally used for generations by this healer and his family and his ancestors into something pills that you can buy in a pharmacy that's what I say it takes a long time it takes a lot of experiments a lot of investment in research and also a lot is it's not just what works but also what are the side effects and what are the dose because when you buy a medicine in a little box it says if you are pregnant just take half a pill if you are less than 10 year olds take one quarter of a pill if you are a normal adult whichever weight between 50 and 80 kilos take one pill and a half somebody had to do all these experiments to see what works best that's why I mean that sometimes I mean I work with traditional I mean local communities and they're always very worried that somebody will steal their knowledge oh, yeah. which I agree but sometimes people forget to realize that from this knowledge that we are documenting maybe when we do an ethnobotanical survey we usually just document which species they use they never write doses or yes. you know we, we just know what is used yeah. for what purpose we don't even know the dose and usually they're mixed as well eh? to get from here to here to that, yeah. I can tell you it takes something like 20 30 years it's just for you to get thinking eh, that is a huge potential because I mean I know people in Malawi they get paid a lot of money to harvest this little seed that is actually poisonous they said yeah we used to cut these bushes eh, because the goats die if they eat the seeds mm -hmm. and now this German company and buys it one kilo is something like hundred dollars but you know this German company probably spent 20 years or so in research and they sell this hundred dollar kilo for probably thousand eh? you don't know mm -hmm. But what I mean is that it takes a long time <coughs> to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I agree. But I always say, yeah, no traditional healer discovered it overnight. He was also trained by somebody. Yeah, they do initiation. Uh huh. Yeah. Takes time as well. Eh? Even if you go to the traditional healer, if you see a young man of 20, you don't feel so comfortable. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather go and see an old man of 80. Ah! <laughs> But a very good point. So the second uh, thing we may want to consider is the sustainability of this uh, harvesting and use of medicinal plants. So going back to Prunus Africana, this study was done in Ethiopia and we can clearly see no stems less than 10 or 10 to 20 centimeters. Can anybody explain why? So they went and did what I mentioned yesterday. They set up a plot in the forest, they measured the diameter of all the trees, and they count them. Eh? They had something like 60% of the trees they sampled were between 10 and 30, and so on and so forth. There were some that were even like over 100, 1 meter and 20 centimeters diameter, so big, but no small trees. Just to remember, Prunus africana, the part of the plant that is used is the bark. They don't cut the tree. So why there's no baby Prunus Africana? Oh, those that work in forestry, eh, they should know. I say that Prunus, we remove the bark, but they discovered that although they only collect the bark, eh, the tree can keep fruiting. Mm -hmm. There's no baby Prunus. Why? Because mm -hmm. So maybe naturally even if they didn't harvest the bark it would not regenerate very well but actually the answer is that as they harvest so much bark the tree becomes stressed and it stops fruiting mm -hmm. so if you stop fruiting 
you will never get recruitment because there are no seats to be recruited. So this is something we need to think when we do these kind of studies. Eh? So sometimes we harvest a park that seems sustainable, but it has another effect that we didn't expect. Another one on the prunus, <laughs> I think it's a really interesting study. This lady in Cameroon, she looked at how much bark should you remove for the tree to survive and keep fruiting. You know, eh, people do all kinds of funny studies these days. Eh? So she was measuring how the bark is regenerating over time, a really nice study, and she concluded that you should only harvest half. So if you divide your tree in four parts, you only harvest about 50%, but I ideally only in one side and the other, so the edges of both can keep growing over time. Interesting. So also we can study not just what is out there, but maybe how could we harvest it better. Another one, I really like this study as well, Piper Guinense. I guess many of you know it, it's like a spice, it's African pepper, we use it for cooking, it's also used for medicine. This is a liana and when we harvest it, we harvest the whole plant. So in general, it's not very sustainable. So this paper, they use the presence, the records of this plant in a West and Central Africa that you can find in GFIF. I think you'll have an exercise on that next week. On, and then they model the distribution. Where is this plant found? And then by looking at how much is being traded eh? between countries, they decide, oh, it's traded in very big numbers considering that it's found in very small parts of the African rainforest. You see most of it is on the Western part. There's some here, but not too much. And they suggested this, this species should become listed as a uh, threatened in IUCN. I completely disagree. And some people in the room might also disagree. Why? So we find a plant that is traded in big numbers, it's used by a lot of people, but it's found in a small part of the rainforest. These uh, European researchers come and say, oh no, no, this we should list it as endangered. I mean, I challenge the idea. Any ideas why? Because if you list a plant in an endangered, now it becomes illegal to trade it. So these people that live next to this forest that have nothing else to do to make a living, now they cannot trade it. And me, I agree. Eh? Harvesting a plant when you remove the whole thing is not very sustainable, but we need to know how much is out there. Maybe it's very abundant, and there's no studies showing that. So it's, it's just to raise the point that sometimes things get listed at IUCN, and maybe we don't have enough information to support this listing. And we also need to think that when we do something like that without enough knowledge, we might be affecting the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of people in Africa that are involved in this trade. See, if you ask me, I would rather get the project money not to study and red list it, but to start cultivating it. So these poor people living in the middle of nowhere now can maybe sell the same plant, but instead of harvesting it from the forest, they can harvest it from their home gardens. So the last step that I was saying when we work with medicinal plants is of course to study the chemical compounds. I'm not an expert in this part, so I'm going to go very quickly. It's just that you need to think as well that when we work with medicine, this is part of important research as well. And I like to put this a slide up when I um, teach in, with younger students. And I guess most of you, you already know that, you know, medicine, I mean, I also use herbal medicine. Eh? I come from a small village in the mountains in Spain and my grandma used to treat me with herbal medicine always. It's cheaper and it was more accessible. But of course, you need to know what you're doing. So it was going back to the healer. Eh? You always feel more confident when you see an older healer, either a, a mama or a man, eh? but it just, because it takes time to get to master these 200 species or whatever we want to do. Then uh, another point is that, of course, things also expire. So if we have this bark that we just harvested, the active compounds might be a lot and very active. If we keep it in the sun for days or for weeks, I mean, things change, eh? It's a bit like taking old pills. Then uh, a lot of the herbal medicine is mixed with alcohol. Sometimes it's good, it enhances the effect of the compounds, sometimes it's bad. So be careful when mixing things with alcohol, even the herbal medicine. And as everything, there's a lot of placebos. 
So you would all know that we have all these white pills that we can buy very cheap. You take them, they're supposed to help you with a headache, nothing happens. It all ha happens the same with bark. That's if you don't know the right person, you can buy bark. You know, it's like from a pine tree, eh? nothing. At least it doesn't kill you, eh? but you know, it doesn't cure you either. So just maybe we can stop for two minutes and we can just maybe get two or three examples from the room about an important medicinal plant in your country. I mean, what is it? Is it a tree? Is it a liana? How is it harvested or where it comes from? Maybe just to have an idea because I mostly work in the rainforest, so I give a lot of examples from the rainforest. So maybe somebody wants to give us an example from the drylands of Kenya. Mm -hmm. I also know some there. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's a... Wait, wait, come here. There's a very interesting species in the dryland called Salvadora Pasica. Uh-huh. A local name is called Esocon. Is it a tree? It is a tree and it is used to, the branches are used for shrub, brushing your teeth. Mm -hmm. And it has elements which are very good antibacterial properties. Antibiotic, yes. yeah. So it is good for the ecosystem because where you find it most of the time, it usually saline degraded areas and that is where you actually find it growing. So it is provide, it has potential for phytoremediation. Yes. So in areas that the soil is maybe not so productive, yeah. there's a potential maybe to grow this, yeah, to tree, grow this tree that is highly appreciated by the local people for antibiotic properties, mm -hmm. just as a toothbrush, but probably they also make tea and give it to babies when they have stomachache. And, and then it grows in areas with very little to no rainfall. So areas where it will be hard to plant yeah. something else. So this is a species to me that looks with potential. Yes. Mm -hmm. Another example? Well, from South Africa? Yeah, from South Africa. This, the one that I want to talk about is called the Yellow Peeling Plain. Mm -hmm. The scientific name is called the Brackenridge Sangwe Baraka Olive. It looks more or less the same like the last one you projected. So it's like a tree? Yeah, it's a tree. And the bark, after you remove the bark, is yeah. yellow. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they use it as a medicinal plant, but some say it's a magical... Magical? Yeah, mm -hmm. magical medicinal plant. So it doesn't grow anywhere in South Africa. You only find it in one, in one part. So they still trade it, they still use it. So they trade it to bigger cities, so it's not just, just local. In, just in informal... Uh, yeah, trade. informal, yeah. Yeah. So I also have one question. Yeah. How does the UICN uh, regulate the trade of endangered medicinal plants? Because I feel like they only list the endangered ones, but they don't monitor. It's a very good point, and that's what I want to say. Of course, it takes... You know, the people that do the IUCN, they meet, I think, every two years to check what do they need to change? Okay. But usually they only discuss what needs to be included. They rarely discuss what is out there that now we have more information and we can actually exclude. Uh -huh. So it becomes a problem because yeah. things change with time. Eh? Maybe a medicinal plant is super trendy and yeah. then something else happens or maybe now malaria treatment is subsidized by the government. Nobody else buys it. Mm -hmm. So it changes. It's a very good point. Yeah. Monitoring is very important. Mm -hmm. Another example? 